So, Jesus gathered his disciples for a private moment, a very personal conversation. And he gathers them and he asks them the question, uh, hey fellas, who do people say I am? Uh, Jesus is carrying his first opinion poll. Uh, maybe he wants to know his popularity among the people. <laughs> or maybe he has a self-esteem issue, an identity crisis of sort. Who do people say I am? Who do you say I am? But no, he's not asking those questions because he's trying to gauge his popularity or he's going through an identity crisis. He actually wants to gauge and see if the disciples, his followers, his learners, really know who he is. And also he wants to reveal himself. And so who do the crowds say I am? Uh, Peter being uh, very talkative and probably a representative of the, uh, the other disciples say, well, some guys say that you are Elijah, you're John the Baptist, but who do you say I am? And Jesus ans and Peter answers correctly. You are the Messiah, the Savior. You are the one we have been waiting for. And Jesus Christ says, correct. But it doesn't end there. Jesus then goes on and says, this is not only who I am. This is what I have come to do. This is what is going to happen to me. He says, the son of man, we have just read that, the son of man is going to be rejected. Now when he uses that phrase, the son of man, it's a self-title that was only used in the book of Daniel. The Son of Man is going to suffer. He will be rejected by the elders and the leaders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and he must be killed. And on the third day, he's going to raise again. Now, something that uh, Matthew puts in that Luke doesn't, uh, Matthew, you have the same story in the book of Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. Matthew is like, Jesus, no way, man. What do you mean? You are our savior. What do you mean you are going to be killed? That is not going to happen to you, Jesus, at least not on my watch. And Jesus rebukes him and says, Satan, get thee behind me. Now, you see, what is happening here is that a follower, a learner, a disciple has rebuked the rabbi. Now that never happened. And the rabbi, Jesus, rebukes him back. Back to our story in Luke. Jesus says, look here, this is what is going to happen. 
I will be killed. I will suffer. But not only that, I am inviting you now that I have revealed myself and what is going to happen to me, I am inviting you. You know, now this is now Jesus making his final pitch. Uh, finally, let me in give you the big invitation. Follow me. Now, that's not the kind of pitch you'd expect. That's, it's not inviting. You're going to die, and then you're inviting us to come and follow you. How is that good news? How is that? Why, why would I want to follow you? You're asking me to, you're saying that you're telling me to deny myself, take up my cross, and follow you? How is that inviting? It was not, it's not, when you hear those words, how do you feel? Do you feel a sense of excitement? Really? We live in a world that tells us something different. We live in a world that tells us, don't deny yourself. In our day and age, these words, deny yourself, they just sound crazy. They sound absurd. Deny yourself, take up your cross and follow Jesus. Our culture says the exact opposite of what Jesus is inviting his disciples, he's inviting you and I to do. The slogans of today are something like this. Do it. Do whatever makes you feel happy. Don't deny yourself. Do whatever makes you feel happy. Whatever floats your boat. Let nothing stops you, stop you. This is a common slogan. Live for yourself. Live for freedom and pleasure. Be true to yourself, buddy. Follow your heart. Especially when you're in a wrong relationship <laughs> and you want everyone's approval. Just, just follow your heart. If it makes you happy, and then, of course, as a commercial, just do it. Don't let anyone tell you what to do. These are common phrases and slogans that have become part of who we are as a society. They, they are not just slogans. These define the way we think and our perspectives. The BBC has a fantastic documentary on the rise of advertising and uh, uh, consumerism, they call it uh, the century of self. It's available on YouTube. Such an apt title of what has happened to us in the last 100 years. Our only current form of self-denial is probably something like health and fitness. No, say no to chocolate. Say yes to waking up early so that you can go for crossfit or do a run. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. Another example would be careerism. Where you sacrifice yourself for a decade or two to put yourself through grad school or work crazy hours for the first five or ten years of your young adult life so that you eventually get to that goal. That salary, that corner office, work for that company. At the end of the day, it is not really sacrifice, it is project self. It is for your own benefit and enjoyment. It's a status symbol. The point here is, in our society, we just can't fathom a vision of the good life that does not involve getting what we want. And I don't know if you have been following the current national debate uh, or all the debates that we have had on sexuality. Currently, there's a whole conversation about the conversation, uh, conversion therapy, therapy bill. We sent out an email and said, hey, here's what it is about. Here's a link that you could follow and read about. 
So read it, pray about it, and speak out uh, up against it. But I've followed that conversation very closely. I've also followed another very interesting conversation. We all know about it, uh, what's happening on the, uh, the parliament, outside the parliament. And there's a, something that is very consistent in all, the, all of those conversations. Three things that I have observed. I don't know if you've observed the same thing. You tell me. Number one, there are certain assumptions that are being made. Number one, that nobody or nothing should be able to stand in your way, in a, in a way of getting what I want. Nobody or nothing should be able to stand in my way to getting what I want. Second assumption, that if anyone does get on my way, it is seen as oppression. <clears throat> uh, is that an amen? <laughs> Number three, if I don't get what I want, I can't be happy. All three of these assumptions, if I'm reading Jesus's, uh, Jesus of Nazareth right, and I could be off on this one, we have been led to believe that God is no longer sacred, but self is now sacred. So we hear Jesus call to deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow him, and it sounds gibberish. It sounds inconsistent with the way we think as a society. The way we think as a society has discipled us. We are learning from our society. And even as Christians, we struggle with this. And even though we say we follow Jesus, we have found a creative way of going around Jesus' invitation to follow him. Here's a long quote by a gentleman called David Platt in a book called uh, Follow Me. I've slightly modified the quote, but let me read it. The way of Jesus is hard to follow. It is hated by many. Almost unknowingly, we shrink back from this cost, choosing to redefine Christianity according to our personal preferences, church traditions, and cultural norms. Slowly but subtly, we take the Jesus of the Bible and twist him into someone with whom we are, we are a little more comfortable with. We dilute what he says about the cost of following him. We, we disregard what he says about those who choose not to follow him. We practically ignore what he says about materialism. And we functionally miss what he says about mission. We pick and choose what we like and don't like from Jesus' teachings. In the end, we create a nice, non-offensive, politically correct, middle-class, Kiwi Jesus who looks just like us and thinks just like us. So what exactly does Jesus mean by deny yourself and take up your cross? The Dictionary of Bible Themes defines self-denial. Please do note, I did not go to Google. It defines self-denial as the willingness to define oneself possessions or status in order to grow in holiness and commitment to God. We rarely even preach on the topic of holiness. The words of Jesus used in the original language, deny yourself, these were very strong terms and they were very similar to how Paul used them in Philippians chapter 3, verse 7 to 9. Let me read it for us. Paul says that whatever gain I had, I count it loss for the sake of of Christ. Deny yourself is counting everything loss 
for the sake of Christ. Paul continues to say, Indeed, I count everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. In some translation, it says dung, cow dung, in order that I may gain Christ. The purpose of self-denial, counting everything loss, all earthly gains, is to become more like Jesus in holiness and obedience to God. You want to grow in Christ-likeness? Deny yourself. Denying yourself includes, and not limited to this, overcoming the persistent fleshly demands of the body, bring them into submission to God's word so that we don't give in to sin. Do not love the world or anything in the world. Because if we love the world, the love of the Father is not in us. The lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life and what we have gained. 1 John 2.15 Galatians 5.24 says, And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified their flesh with its passions and desires. And it's a hard thing, friends. It's part of the reason why getting, uh, part of the reason why getting up to read and enjoy God's word is a life-giving habit. Remember the challenge that I gave us at the beginning of this sermon series? To read through the Gospels by the end of April? How are we doing? Just deny yourself a few minutes. You're skipping to it. Okay, cool. I love that. Someone give that girl a cookie. <laughs> Friends, we also need Self-denial for the Christian also means renouncing oneself as a center of, of existence and recognizing Christ as the one and true center. Is Jesus Christ at the center of your life? Do you allow him through his Holy Spirit as he speaks through his word to shape your perspectives of life, to, to challenge how you think about some things? the things you say or do or buy or not do or not buy. It means ac acknowledging that the old self is dead and the new life is now hidden with Christ in God. Galatians 2.20 If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. From the moment of our new birth in Christ Jesus, when you decided, I want to follow Christ, self-denial becomes a daily exercise for the rest of your life on earth. This is what, as Christians, we signed up to, breaking news, or just in case you didn't know about it. With the Holy Spirit now dwelling in us as followers of Christ, we are thrust into a conflict between the divine spirit of God and our carnal self, it is going to be a struggle every single day. That's why we have to deny ourselves and take up our cross every single day. Paul describes this ongoing struggle in Romans chapter 7. He's basically saying, the things that I really want to do, I don't get to do them. And the things that I do not want to do, I end up doing them. Paul himself, the apostle, also struggled. But by the grace of God, the Holy Spirit working within us and our willingness to deny ourselves for the sake of Christ, then Christ starts forming something in us. Only by God's grace and the power of the Holy Spirit can we learn to de deny ourselves. Titus chapter 2 verse 11 verse 13 says, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us how to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled lives, upright and godly lives at this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so through daily self-denial and crucifying of flesh, our life in Christ 
grows, it is strengthens, it is strengthened and it develops more and more. Christ now becomes our life. The, the famous words of a German called Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he said, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. When Christ invited you to follow him, he invited you to come and die. Die to self and die and even with the possibility of physical death. Remember when we started this sermon series, I said, this invitation to follow Christ has never changed, whether it was in the first century or the 21st century, whether it is that person from Jos, Nigeria, or Iran, or in Somalia, or in Nelson, the invitation is the same. The price should be the same. For the first century Christian, they left everything to follow Christ. Why should it be different for us? At the beginning of this sermon series, I said that you need to check on the idols, the things that we have worshipped and replaced God for. What is that one thing if the Lord came asking for, you will struggle giving up? That might be an idol. Then we ramped it up and last week when we looked at Peter and James and John who left everything, their income, their investments, their, world, their possessions, their boats and nets to follow Jesus. Now we go a notch higher. Jesus Christ is saying, not just your possessions, not just your idols, but you. I want you. Consider this. Do you think of your relationship with God primarily in terms of what I get from him or in terms of what he wants of me? Are you willing to deny yourself, take up your cross and follow him? Unless, uh, are you willing to do those things? Here's what we can do practically. Jesus Christ says, if anyone, anyone, it's not limited to older people, younger people. If anyone, this invitation is open to anyone. If anyone wants, wishes, desires to follow me. So here is practical thing number one. Desire to follow Christ. Desire to follow him. Number two. Adopt a life-giving life -giving sacrifices that bring us closer to God. But, so deny, then take up your cross. When Jesus is telling the disciples to take up their cross, the, the idea of the cross is not what we have today. Our idea of the cross these days, it's more of a, an ornament, something we just put on our chest or, you know, tattoo it. Uh, it's way more than that. For the disciples, they had seen, this was the way the Romans, uh, uh, having someone been crucified at that time, was the way the Romans punished people. It was capital punishment. The Jews had seen their fellow brothers and sisters walking up that dusty road onto a hill, carrying a cross. And so when you're carrying that cross, it, it, one, it is heavy. Two, you're being beaten as you're going up the hill to the, your execution point. Everyone is watching. But also it shows this, that you are submitting to the Roman rule. And then finally, you're going to have a cr gruesome death on the cross. It's going to be painful and everyone will be watching you. And so the idea of carrying their cross was, this, this was, this is capital punishment. But now Jesus Christ is saying, carry your own cross. 
deny yourself and carry your cross daily. This is the image that he's painting to the disciples. And follow me. Here is how we can deny ourselves and daily take up our cross so that we may follow Christ. A few suggestions. Consider things like fasting, denying yourself food so that you can be with Christ and pray for others. These are life-giving disciplines. Jesus practiced it. We see that in Matthew chapter 4. Consider living modestly rather than indulging in excessive luxury in an area in, uh, uh, and consider self-denial in that area. Perhaps the most significant way we practice self-denial is how we love and esteem our brothers and sisters in Christ. Self-denial is a basis for the Christian fellowship and service within the church. Philippians chapter 2 says, Let each one of you look not only into their own interests, but also into the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. You, though he was, uh, though he was in the form of God, through Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. When you are willing to sacrifice your time, your energy, your rights, your position, your reputation, your influence, your privileges, your comfort, and even your very life for the sake of Christ, you exemplify what it means to deny yourself. And yes, there's a cost that accompanies following Jesus Christ, but it is worth it. Let me put it differently. He is, Jesus Christ, worth it. There is an indescribable joy to be found, deep satisfaction to be felt, and an eternal purpose to be fulfilled in dying to ourselves and living for Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ only. But dying is hard. It's no wonder that so many of us try to avoid the difficult road of following Jesus. but it is worth every effort. Friends, let me call us to a point and a time of reflection. I want us to take some moments of silence, consider the words of Jesus. What would denying yourself look like for you? What would taking up your cross look like? And I want you to take just a moment and consider your own life and this challenge to you. You don't have to make big steps. Jesus Christ is not out looking for perfection, but progress. It's okay to say, Lord, this is a hard message. This is hard for me. But I want to try. I want to take the first step in following you, in denying myself. Lord, show me the places that I need to make sacrifices in for your glory. Let's have a moment of silence.
Dear Lord, because of who you are, our Savior, Lord, we have the confidence to trust in you, to believe in you, to believe that you have our, our best interest at heart. Lord, give us strength. Help us know what it looks like to deny ourselves and live as followers of Christ in this society. When everyone and everything tells us to think about ourselves and our personal freedom, to insist on what we have and are. Lord, help us. Lord, also forgive us for the times when we have actually denied you for the decisions at times that we have made that by your Holy Spirit you have nudged or confronted us or challenged us but we have ignored and now we come to you Lord and saying Lord forgive us we acknowledge our mistake personally Lord I, I find it hard Forgive us, forgive me for the times when I have complained and said, haven't I denied myself enough for you? But Lord, you are no man's debtor. And so Lord, give us wisdom, understanding in how best to follow you. Help us understand what it means to carry our cross every single day. But Lord, let us not just look at the sacrifice that we Make, let us look at the sacrifice that you ultimately made on the cross so that we may be reconciled with God the Father. Lord, let us look with hope and with joy of what you have set before us. Let our eyes be lifted up for the beauty and the blessing of following you. Let us not miss out on the joy of following you because of our selfishness. But Lord, may we constantly look up to you. And Lord, may we be known as a church, as a people, corporately and individually, as those ones who love you so much that we want to live for you, for your glory, and say yes to you in every aspect of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In a few minutes we are going to be